everyone. Welcome back to Dad Space, the podcast for dads by dads. I have a very interesting guest on the podcast today who's going to shape in us like hot steel into something that's something different than what it started from in our conversation. Uh, Corey's here on the podcast and excited to have Corey Yates on the show. He has Yates Unicorn Ranch Ministries at yatesunicornranch.org. I have the website up while we're chatting. It's a great website. You have to go there. Link in the show notes. But Corey, welcome to the Dad Space Podcast. Glad to have you here. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate it, man. I'm glad to be here. I'm excited to see where this conversation is going to take us, man. Okay, so when I, when I first saw Yates Unicorn Ranch, I thought... Is this like a -a Build-A-Bear, you know, where like kids can come and make a bear? And I'm like, is it a unicorn ranch where you walk away with your own little... No, 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 no. There's a story behind the unicorn in the unicorn ranch. We shared it together when we chatted earlier. I'd love for you to explain the the foundation of the unicorn ranch. Where does the unicorn come in here? Because I think that was fascinating. Yeah, so I think that's a fair question. You know, I had to say if I didn't have a unicorn ranch, uh, I'd have some questions too, so... Um, so it started when I was in the military, I would have soldiers come up to me and they would say, man, you know, Sergeant, I'm sorry. I missed formation. Couldn't find my shoes. Kid was sick. Dog died. Car wouldn't start. Whatever. And I would say, it's cool, man. I get it. You had to walk a unicorn. Yep. Shocked look on their face. Man, that's, that's messed up, Sergeant. Said, no, it's, it's fine, man. First one's on me. Then they would come, same soldier. Man, you know, Sergeant, I can't do staff duty, man. I, was, I would just stop them right there and say, look, man, I need you to bring me a unicorn. I'm going to put it on my ranch and I'm going to take good care of it for you. That way you can do what I need you to do. So that's kind of where the tongue in cheek beginnings of the Yates Unicorn Ranch uh, started. And then when I got out of the military in 2017, I knew I was being called into the ministry, but I wasn't really sure exactly what my lane was going to be. So I started getting really involved in missions, going on mission trips, doing mission projects locally. And I, I would hear the same things a lot of times when I was putting a team together to to go do anything. They would be like, oh, man, you know, I, I'd really love to help, man, but I just don't have the money or I got to get a haircut or I got a casserole in the oven or whatever, you know. <laughs> and uh, so that kind of inspired me to develop this ministry where um, we raise money to send people on mission trips. So let's say you came to me and you were like, man, Corey, you know, I, I I've got this opportunity to go to Peru, man. We're going to be putting solar panels on mud huts, man. I really feel like God's calling me to do this. or I really feel like uh, I'm I'm called to serve and go on this trip. But, man, I I don't have the money. I don't really know how to raise money for missions. Can you help me? And I would say, absolutely, man. We we would sit down and have a conversation, and we would teach you how to raise money. We would pay part of your way. We'll pay your whole way, just depending on your circumstances and whatever the board decides. So, that's where the Yates Unicorn Ranch Ministries uh, began, and you know I'm just I'm still collecting unicorns. I'm just doing it for the kingdom as opposed to Uncle Sam. Wow. Okay, that's just, that's fascinating. Um, for you, after you've now retired from the military, how much traveling? How much missions work have you done personally? Have you where have you been? Yeah, we've we've gone to uh, the Dominican Republic twice. We built a hospital over there for uh, it's in Barrio Cien Fuego. It is a very poor, poor area of um, the Dominican. We partnered with um, Champs Missions to go on that trip, and we've we've done that several times. Um, we've gone with them to the Bahamas a couple of times to, after Hurricane Dorian came through. We went down there to uh, build a couple of roofs on some different facilities, uh, an elderly living facility, and um, we also uh, went down there on another trip to put to build a, a vocational school. So where they get the high school kids, ninth to twelfth grade, and they the companies on the island have partnered with them to teach them trades. So that way, when they get out of school, they have a they can work right into a career as opposed to having to leave the island. So. Um, it's kind of a retention retention program they have going down there. That's another Champs project. Um, we've been to Jamaica a couple of times. We partnered with Baylock Baptist Church over there, and uh, we have gone over there to do some building. We've done some. Uh, we've assisted with medical mission trips over there, and then uh, we've got actually our first our own trip going to Honduras in June. This is the first trip that the Yates Unicorn Ranch is completely responsible for and uh completely funding ourselves uh we've been raising money for that and um man it's it's a great opportunity we're going over there to a place called rancho ebenezer it's a kind of like an orphanage a kid's ranch over there where like if the state has to take a kid they can bring them to this facility 
and uh, we're going to go over there and serve. They've got some construction projects um, around the facility and then also in the local area that we're going to be able to help with. We're going to be able to teach um, some BBS and um, go over there and love on the kids and uh, help out the staff and some some opportunities there. So we're looking forward to that. But we also have um, local mission projects that we're doing. Like right now, we've got three different houses that we're working on here. We, we put a roof on one. Um, uh, about a month ago and we've got to finish the flooring on that one and we've done some uh we had another guy had a tree through his roof and uh he had it patched up but it started leaking so we went over there and did that and then we've got some yard work jobs coming up um next week so Good. man we're just uh we we're getting getting uh getting busy man just trying to serve god and uh and love on people man so okay wh- why is this so important to you Corey? like why is serving strangers and your community. Why is this front and center for you? you? Could be doing something completely for yourself, building your own little world, chasing money, chasing cars, building your own little nest egg, concerned about yourself. But you're so outwardly focused. Why? Why is that important to you? Man, we got to show the love of Jesus to people. If we don't do it, then nobody will. And and the thing is, is if you, if you. It, it, I'll be honest with you, man. I started this for selfish reasons. Like I thought I was going to go over there and I was going to bless these folks. Like I was going to go over to these poor countries, my rich American self, and I was going to help them out. And I was going to do all this stuff for me. And, uh, you know, selfishly, I do receive the, I I feel like I receive the biggest blessing when I go over there and I do. And I say, I, I I mean, we, cause I, I don't do any of this by myself, man. I've got a team of great people that are behind me and, Man, they are amazing. And but when we go over there to serve, those people can't do anything for us. They can't they can't return the favor. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He gave us something that we cannot we can't return the favor. He gave us eternal life. He gave us salvation. He gave his life for us in such a gruesome way. And people need to know that that love is not just a a story in some book that's thousands of years old. Like that is an event that actually happened, historically proven event that actually happened. And people need to understand that that love is still there. And regardless of what they can do for anybody, God loves them because that we can't do anything to earn salvation except put our faith in Jesus. That's it. So there's no works that we can do. There's none of that stuff. And people need to understand that God loves them. And if we don't show them that, then they're never going to know. And people listening to our conversation, Corey, that haven't met you yet, they're probably thinking, oh, this guy's got everything together. Easy life. Church guy, <laughs> right? He's It's easy for him, right? It's easy for him. I'm not a church person. I don't, I don't understand that life. Yeah, man. But your story on how you got into the military, when we chatted earlier, I mentioned something along the lines that I really do have a huge amount of respect for anyone that serves your country because not so many, not many people do that. And your response to that was very interesting. And I'd love to kind of, to, to kind of talk a little bit more about your story, your personal story. Yeah, yeah, of course. For those that are listening to you now going, it sounds like you're in a great place. You're helping lots of people, but you probably had it easy. You didn't have it easy. So tell us a little bit about the origin story of how you ended up in the military. So, man, you know, I was born and raised in a church, in a religious church. And there's a difference yeah. in but there's a difference in religion and being a Christ follower. Because religion is a bunch mm-hmm. of rules and a bunch of nonsense, a bunch of man-made stuff that it doesn't matter in eternity. A relationship with Christ is what I'm what I'm focused on. And I'm not saying like that anybody has to have a relationship for us to help them because we help anybody and everybody doesn't matter. Like religion is out the window. We don't care about any of that stuff, but you know, I was born and raised in a church, Southern Baptist hellfire and brimstone. And uh, you know, so when I was younger, I did what I was, I did what I, what I saw in my environment, you know, and uh, walked down the aisle, prayed the prayer eight, nine, I don't even know. And then, um, you know, I was 10 years old when I was starting to be able to get out of the house and go to other people's, places and stuff and uh, i was at a friend of mine's house and we found a box of magazines up in his dad's attic that were not better homes and gardens Mm -hmm. so we uh made the decision i made the decision to look at those magazines and that started a cycle of addiction for me and um man it was it was it just grabbed me and i i got addicted to that rush 
Yeah, I, I looked at the images and all that kind of stuff, and they had an effect on me too, but it was the rush of, you know, doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing and a little rush of not getting caught. Well, mostly not getting caught. <laughs> so then uh, at 13 years old, I started smoking. 14, I was drinking. 16, started having sex. And I uh, got a girl pregnant right out of high school. I was 18 years old. Married her. And we lived happily ever after, right? Heck hmm. no. It was a train wreck, man. And uh, so we thought, you know, having one kid wasn't enough pressure. So we we decided we was going to have two to fix the marriage. You know, well, we was three months old. Or my daughter, my oldest daughter was three months old when we first got divorced. And then I turned to drugs, man. I, I moved off and uh, started partying, found drugs. And then I realized how much control the uh, people that control the, the flow of drugs in a circle, how much control they had over the circle. So I decided I wanted to be uh, a pharmaceutical representative myself and uh, specializing <laughs> in the meth trade. Mm -hmm. So, uh, man, I started dealing meth and uh, man, my life was crazy. I, I had to do all the things that you would think that a meth dealer would have to do. And it got to the point where I, I knew that I had to make a change. And, you know, there's a lot of guys that I served with, great Americans. They joined because... You know, one of the, their brother got killed or they felt a civic duty to to join the military or they felt some kind of patriotic call on their heart or whatever. But, man, I joined out of self-preservation completely. It was completely selfish. And I, I had to I had to get an environment, get into an environment where I. I had to have control over me, like I not not I didn't, but I had to be in a controlled environment. That's what I'm trying to say. So the army was the most controlled environment that I could think of. So. Man, I, I sobered up long enough to pass the drug test to go into my recruiter's office. And man, 10 days later, I was laying in basic training, rubbing my bald head, wondering what in the world I done got myself into. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it saved my life, man. It really did because I was in an environment where I couldn't get to the people that I because I, I tried to get away from them my on my own and I couldn't. I wasn't strong enough. So because I was addicted to the money, I was addicted to the women, I was addicted to all the things that come along with being a drug dealer and being the shot caller. Like that's what I was addicted to. And uh, as well as the drugs. So I, I had to be in an environment where I couldn't I couldn't get to those people. And some maybe more importantly, where those people couldn't get to me, like I had to disappear. And uh, so I didn't tell anybody what I was doing. And uh, I, I just left, man. And that's a heck of a way to go through rehab. I, I don't recommend it, but that's one way to do it. I was laying and I would lay in basic training and I would wake up with flashbacks of, you know, hitting on a meth bong or, you know, things in my life that were undone or things that were done and I would just wake up and it would took, take me a minute to get my bearings and and all that so that was basically training was pretty brutal because I didn't tell you know my, my recruiter said look man if you're going to get in here you can't be telling them that you ever did drugs like you can't you can't and the job requirement that I had it required a top secret security clearance so even more so no man I've never done drugs never done drugs never done drugs mm -hmm. so I couldn't tell anybody why I was struggling. I just had to suffer in silence. So I did that and uh, made it through basic training, made it to AIT, which that's for the United Military people. That's where the Army sends you to go look, to learn how to do your job. And, uh, you know, I got a little bit more freedom in AIT and uh, I chose to party. I know, man, you're just as shocked as I was. Mm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. So, uh, man, I started drinking and uh, partying. But see, I knew that drugs were off limits because they would get me kicked out. And, uh, man, I was partying, minding my own business. And then there was a girl. That's how it always goes. And then a man's just yeah. trucking along, minding his own business. And the girl comes along and messes it all up. So mm -hmm. anyway, I didn't really have no interest in this woman, but, um, she was stubborn, man. She just wouldn't leave me alone. So I say that tongue in cheek, but it's kind of true. And, uh, so eventually she wore me down and we got married. And six days later, she went to Iraq. And then she was over there for 11 months. And then a month before she came home, I went over for 13 months. So for the first two years of our marriage, man, we were, uh, one of us was in Iraq. So two years we'd been married before we ever lived in the same house. So there were wow. two things we knew for sure. We hated each other and only God could fix it. Because she hmm. was raised in a, in a Christian home as well, assembly of God. Glory, hallelujah. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> So we knew that we had to get God involved in our marriage. So we did. And uh, we went and found us a church that was kind of in between my solemn Baptist and her pew running. And uh, we started attending. And uh, 
about a month in, we went to the one of the pastors there, and we we're like, "Hey, man, y'all got some marriage counseling?" I said, "My wife is hard headed, man. She don't want to change." And uh, he started laughing, and she punched me in the ribs. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so we went and seen Pastor John, and we were sitting in his office about thirty minutes after our conversation started. He leaned back in his chair and kind of rubbed his chin, his beard a little bit. He said, "I'm going to have to send y'all to somebody." <laughs> <laughs> so we got referred out and uh man my wife and i um i'm proud to say you know now we've been married 15 years and uh it's just a god thing completely man and uh, it's yeah. been it has been hell because about five years into our marriage you know I, when we got married i didn't want to have any kids because i already screwed that up the first time i didn't want to be responsible yeah. for that again you know and um when uh we started she was she always wanted to have kids that's all she ever wanted to be was a mom and uh so about five years into our marriage the holy spirit started working on me and i told her i said you know what i i really feel like it's time for us to maybe start trying to have kids boom the next month we was pregnant i was like come on god like (laughs) got jokes man but uh you know we lost that baby man Uh, about a month about a month after she was pregnant we lost that baby and we've had six losses along the way and so that's a whole other story in itself man we had to do ivf and uh it's been quite the road man we've got now um twin six-year-olds a four-year-old a two-year-old and we've got one due in august so god has been good on that but it has been another hell on earth getting there you know once we got the process figured out um we did the ivf and they were able to retrieve um five viable eggs and you know we had some in storage and and all that so uh we we got the last one um in the oven right now so to speak so yeah. Um, but that was that was hard, man. Uh, a, a man trying to navigate that with his wife is very difficult because we don't we suffer the loss, too. And that's that's kind of, you know, a lot of times the guys get glossed over. We because we have to mourn in our way, which in my way was I don't even know how to process this. You know, I, I was trying to to help my wife through it and nothing that I was saying or doing was helping at all because I didn't understand the connection that she had with the loss. Cause it's a completely different, like there's this chemical and all kinds of things going on in their body that we don't get. So it's very difficult for a man to be there for his wife, but it's also very difficult for a man to know how to mourn that loss himself. So at a point, there was one point in 2015 where I just turned away from God because I was like, man, we, we want this kid to love and to hold and to cherish and to raise in, in, in your house and you've got all these crackheads throwing their kids in the dumpsters and you hear all this crazy stuff about, yeah. these, you know, people just throwing their kids away and they don't want to have them. But you'll let them have kids, but you won't let me have kids. Hmm. I was like, man, I'm done with you because I'm living for you. I'm praying. I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to be doing and you ain't giving me what I want. So I basically threw a fit and I just walked away. And uh, it took a couple of years, man, for me to come back. It took the coaching of one of my mentors and disciple makers that is poured into my life. Cause you know, we, we eventually did figure it out in 2017. We had, we had our twins. And at that point I was kind of at a crossroads because I was like, God gave me what I asked for. He answered our prayers. We have two healthy babies, but if I come back to him, then I'm going to be a hypocrite because I walked away. I was like, no, I'm not, you know, so I had a real hard time navigating what that looked like. And what, I, what, what I realized was that and it's okay to feel some type of way towards God. It's okay to be mad. It's okay to to be upset. It's okay to be frustrated. God's big enough. He can handle it. But see, hmm. part of the story that I forgot to tell earlier, when I was getting high and doing all that stuff, I was um, – I had a girl come to me one time and told me that she was pregnant. We'd been getting high together. And uh, I did what I thought any responsible method would do, and I paid for her abortion. Hmm. So I blamed myself for our infertility. Hmm. I thought that it was my fault because of the sins of my past that I was being punished. So I had a hard time navigating that as well. And But what I realized was that that's... It's not how God works, man. He doesn't work like that. Once you confess your sin and he says forgiven, 
boom, that's it. It's done. Yeah, yeah. And I could be having this conversation with you, a murderer, a drug dealer, a sex addict, a meth addict, all these things, man. But I'm having this conversation with you as a redeemed child of God, man. So Mm. what I've learned through this process is it doesn't matter what you've done. God loves you. And that's the message that I'm trying to get people to see is that it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter if you even don't even believe in God. He still loves you because he created you. And Mm. that's the thing that I'm trying to communicate. But no, it as you said, it hasn't been an easy road to get here. And, uh, you know, I'm not. I go to church. But in my opinion, I think the church is one of the biggest mission fields in America, especially in the mm. South where I live, because we, we live in the Bible Belt and you've got a lot of people just warming the pews that ain't doing nothing. Like they get they think that that one hour sermon or actually 30 minute sermon that they better be out of there in time to catch the Cowboys game uh, yeah. is enough to get them to heaven. And that's not true, man. It, there's a lot of people living under that false assumption that will you ask them, hey, man, would you consider yourself a Christian? Oh, oh Yeah. Yeah, I'm. Yeah. Well, how do you know? Well, I go to church. Yeah. Okay. My great grandpappy built this church. Okay. Mm-hmm. You can't go to heaven yeah. on. It's not a generational thing. Like faith yeah. is not something you can pass down. You can pass down the acts of it, but there has to be a personal decision made, and then there has to be a heart change, and then there has to be a life change in order for it to be true and real. You can't just walk down an aisle like I did at eight years old, pray a prayer, get dunked. And get your fire insurance because that's just yeah. uh, that's not how it works. There has to be no. a transformation, and that's where the fruits come in, the fruits of our life, you know. And if there hasn't been a heart transformation, then I kind of wonder if there's been a transformation at all. You know, obviously I can't see anybody's heart, and I can't judge anybody. Um, but I feel like if if somebody's living for the Lord, then there's you're going to be able to see evidence of that in their life. And sadly, in America, the church ain't like that because. Church in other countries is different, man. Like I, I was at Honduras, um, and on a Wednesday night, pouring down rain in the in the uh, rainforest over there in the jungle, and this box truck pulls up, a rider truck, people just pile out of the back of it. Had been riding, standing up for an hour to get to church on a Wednesday to worship. Mm. You know, I mean, right. those people over there, people that are persecuted, people that you know, like in China where it's it's illegal. Those people, like they, there's no faking it over there. Like. It, you will lose your life. And, and that's the kind of commitment that other countries have to Christ. But it's not like that because we're just so casual about it here in America. It, it's just different. And that's sad because I'll give you an example. When I was in Honduras at the same, the same night, we were celebrating in a church, if you want to call it that. It was not even really a building. There was cinder block walls about three blocks up all the way around the outside. And there was a concrete stage and a tin roof. And that was it. That was all the church building there was. Hmm. And those people were happy to be there. They 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 sacrificed to be there to, to praise God and sing. And when I got back, we were sitting in our big you know, multi-million dollar sanctuary talking about our multi-million dollar education center that we were about to build and with all these fancy ornate statues all around. And, and I'm thinking, man, we, we got it wrong. Like that, and, and I'm not saying those things aren't important to some people. And some people need those fancy houses and all that stuff to go worship in. And, you know, but I, I just feel like our commitment to Christ in America might not be exactly what it should be because mm-hmm. everything, not everything, that's not, that's not the right terminology, but there's so much, surface level Christianity in America. And I feel like once yeah. we, we, we got to get past that. And and that's why, you know, discipleship is so important because we got to help other people, young believers. And, and just because a believer walked down the aisle 30 years ago and has been going to church ever since, it doesn't mean they're seasoned. Yeah. So. So your outside perspective, going to different countries, interacting with people outside of the U S does help shape and reshape how you show up in the world, right? Because you're seeing something different than just your little neighborhood, your community that you see every day. I think some of the people that sit in those pews could really benefit from seeing a little tin roof shack where people struggle to get there, like you mentioned. Like some perspective really helps. When I was a young 
kid in high school, I had the chance to go, I'm in Canada, I had the chance to go to Bushwick in Brooklyn back in the 90s, when it was not very safe for someone like me to be walking around Bushwick in New York City. Mm -hmm. And it, I got to go with people from this place that they, they serve kids. And we went down as a missions trip. They have like a whole fleet of buses. We brought mechanics down to resurrect old buses. We served, we painted, we built, we did plumbing, we did electrical. We came down for a week and just gave all of our gifts and talents. And then we had the chance to go out with people from the community into the community. And I can remember going to some of the projects at like 17, 18 years old and standing in a urine-soaked, sticky elevator going up to the third floor to go visit a family and just being completely overwhelmed by what I have at home and what these people think are is good. And I'm like, there's such a gap. And until then, I didn't realize how good I had it until I actually walked those streets and stood in that space and saw people accept me. Despite my privilege, they accepted me and said, thank you for coming and helping us. And I'm like, it shaped my whole world <laughs> as a kid. <laughs> and I, I'm so happy I had that experience because that shapes everything for me going forward. And I just think more of us need to get some perspective in life. I agree with that. I think that every kid in America between the ages of 12 and 16 need to go to a third world country and see what that looks like. I think it would change the <laughs> fabric of our nation. If every kid could go and see that, because we're so entitled in America, yeah. we're so like, I want it right now. I want, you know, we, we desire instant gratification and all that, man. When, and, and I, I keep referring back to Honduras, but there's places in America that are just like this. Yeah. We went to Honduras and we were passing out food bags, a pound of lard, a pound of rice and a pound of beans. And these people were in, to in in tears of joy to get this food. And it would feed right. them and their kids for a week. It's mm. that little bit, they could stretch it out and make it last them a week. So there's poverty in America, but the poor people in America aren't as poor as poor people around the world. So there's a different level True. of poverty in other third world countries that don't have all the amenities we have, don't have welfare, don't have all that kind of stuff. Now, I'm not saying that there's not people in America that need help because we have local local projects going on too. And there's people yeah. right here where I live, man, that, that where I live in, in, in Northeast Texas is there is a median income of 18 to $22,000. And that's not a lot of money to be raising kids on. So there's nope. a lot of need right here in our own country. And, and I'm trying to build that, you know, like, and, and, and I'm just going to share a big vision, man. I, I feel like what I would like to see is a Yates unicorn, ranch truck in every state every city where if somebody's got a need they can call us we send a service truck out to their house and we've got guys that are qualified to do all kinds of stuff we do an assessment on their property boom we go take it take care of it that's the wow. vision that i have for this and then also you know we've got places all around you know and I, a house on each continent where we're sending people to go work in different villages and different things like that. And, and, you know, so that's where I'm headed now. I, you know, we're three years old and uh, we are getting traction. We're growing. Uh, so it's going to take us a little while to get there. But that's that's what I would like to see is th the more people that we can help. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's about helping people and showing them the love of Christ, whatever that. So as, like. as you look at your kids now. In your role as dad, you've got this whole story, backstory that you shared. It's amazing to hear where you've come from and where you, what you've done and what you've seen. You look at your kids now. In the role of dad, What what is something that makes you super excited and proud? And what is something that makes you nervous about being a dad? I'll tell you one of the things that makes me nervous about being a dad was uh gracie one of my twins she told me one day several years ago dad i want to be just like you now that made me stop like it stopped me in my tracks and it made me think in my mind the first reaction was i'm not sure you do because <laughs> i'm pretty jacked up like that's what i'm thinking in my mind like you don't want to be like me you want to be opposite of me so it's really kind of made me look at 
everything, man, because guys, girls, whoever's listening, y'all need to understand your kids see more than what you think they do. All the things you think you're hiding from them, you probably ain't. And it's very important for us to understand that they're going to model what they see. Right. I'm a very, uh, I have a very boisterous voice. I'm loud. And if I get frustrated, the volume keeps going up. I really struggle with that because I see my kids doing the same thing with their mm-hmm. kids or they're interacting with each other and they don't get their way. So they start yelling. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I really got to work on that. I got to work on my patience. I got to work on getting down at their level instead of talking down to them, like sit on the floor and get eyeball to eyeball with them and try to connect and do what I want them to do because they're going to do what I do, even if it's not yeah. what I want them to do, because they're a yeah. model what they see, because what I do, they see that more than they don't hear anything I say, but they see everything I do. Yeah. And I, I need you to understand I, I'm preaching to me more than I'm preaching to anybody else because it, yeah. I have the head knowledge, man. But, but, but putting this stuff into practice, it's not easy, man. It, it's simple. But it's not easy. Just like salvation, man. It's simple, but it's not easy. Yeah. And it takes constant practice, constant training. It takes us men. We've got to have other men in our life pouring into us. We have to go to them and we have to give them permission to speak into our lives. Because even as self-aware as any of you might be, you still got blind spots. And we yeah. can't see those from the outside. So we have to have other men in our life that we trust to give them permission to come to us and say, look, man, you need to quit being a knucklehead or man, you, maybe you need to rethink about this or, yeah. you know, we, we just have to have those influences in our life. Like I'm a member of an organization called the dad edge Alliance. Yeah. Larry Hagner, he has a podcast, uh, yep. the dad edge Alliance, and it is a great, a wealth of information, um, on this kind of stuff. And those guys in that Alliance, are those guys like th- they are the people that you can, and it doesn't matter where they're from. Like we connect, we got guys from all over the world in, in, in the group and it's a, it's weekly call teams and guys that are doing life together. And you just come there and you can just come there with your head in your hand and just shaking your head. And there's somebody in that group that's going to have information that's going to benefit your situation because it's, mm-hmm. it's collective therapy. You know, we've all got like, none of us are smarter than all of us. Right. So good. I like that. I like that. That's so good. I heard that yesterday on, on a call that I was on, and I, I mean, I even jotted down. I, I jotted it down. Yeah. So w- that's that's that group therapy, man. We we have to get other guys involved in our life that um, will speak truth to us, no matter how we're acting. And here's the key, though: we can't get upset when they do that. Like we got to take right. it because if we give them permission, it's it's going to sting sometimes. Because pride yeah. is an evil mistress, man. Pride yeah. will, will make you think you got it figured out. And when somebody tells you you don't, it's going to be real hard for us to say, you know what, man, you're right. Or it's going to be yeah. real, real hard for us to say, man, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah. And that's the most one of the most important things we can do to our kids. Because I, I will get loud, you know, and, and, and the hot button times are supper time and bedtime. I guess that's just a typical a typical stressful time for people. And those are the times where, especially it's at bedtime, they're acting around, acting crazy, running around, and I'm tired from the end of the day, and I still have to show up as a dad. And yeah. there's, I don't do that always. And when I don't, when I lay him down and I kiss him goodnight, I apologize. And I tell him, look, baby, I'm sorry. Daddy didn't mean to yell. And, and I don't try to make excuses for myself. I just own it. I messed up. I apologize, and I pray that you'll forgive me. And yeah. they do. They will. Because kids are yeah. resilient, man. Kids are really resilient. And they're really forgiving by nature. Like, they, they want to have a connection. And that's another thing that's very difficult for me to navigate, too, is I have four littles that want a connection. Yeah. So a lot of times, what they try to do to get that connection is not always positive. So I have to figure out how to connect with each individual kid, how they understand it, because each one of them is different. So it's yeah. a... It's it's a very challenging um, way to navigate parenting. It you know, and it's not. Uh, it definitely takes work on our part. But the thing is, is all of this stuff that I'm talking about it, is skills. Like it's not you're not nobody's born with this stuff, man. Nobody's just no. automatically like this is stuff that you have to work on, 
And it's stuff that you can develop. I've learned through the DEA and through other men pouring into my life that you can develop these skills, but you have to do the work. And a lot of us, yeah. sadly, don't. They'll just give their kid a screen or they'll give their kid, sit them in front of the TV or give them a video game and yeah. check out. And, uh, man, that's, that's raising, that's raising lazy kids, man. Like there's a whole, it's a whole other conversation. We talk about people that don't want to work. You know what I mean? Like kids that don't want to work nowadays and the trades is in a bad situation. And, you know, cause for me making knives, I'm a custom knife maker by trade. And, uh, there's not a lot of kids that want to get out there and get dirty in the shop, you know? And I yeah. got into that as a means to bridge a gap with my oldest son. He was, um, into knife making and, and blacksmithing and, um, I started doing it alongside him trying to, to bridge that gap, you know, from all the years that I chose drugs over him. And it was a great way for us to bond. And, but the thing is, is God used that because that's what kind of, that's where the ministry kind of started was through this, through the knife making process. I started realizing that a rock in the ground, a piece of iron ore becoming a knife is a lot like a person becoming a Christian. There has to be transformation. There has to be we have to become something different using the same minerals, the same ore, the same steel. So I started praying about that. And, you know, right now I do mobile forging demonstrations where I will give my testimony. And, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit, we, we talk quite a bit about it. And uh, what I have discovered is that the forge, it represents environments and how our environments will make us moldable. And then the hammer represents decisions that are either made for us at a young age or by us at an older age. And that's how we get shaped. So I travel around and do a mobile forging demonstration where I give my testimony and I talk about how I talk about the environments I was in. And I talk about the decisions I made and how they shaped me into who I was. And then, you know, in order for a knife, a piece of steel to become a knife, it has to be quenched. So it has to go through a rapid process uh, where it's got to be heated up and then cooled really quickly and you know, I kind of uh, relate that to baptism and how we come out a new a new creation, but there's still a lot of yeah. work to do. Because a yeah. Christian, like we think in America, we got to get people down the aisle, pray the prayer, get them ducked, and, and then we're done. That's the end of it. But really, that's where our job begins, because it's yeah. not normal for somebody to be a Christian in this world. It's not normal for somebody to pray, read their Bible, learn how to fellowship with each other. Like those things have to be taught their skills. And that's where discipleship comes in. And that's uh, one thing that I think that another thing that I think the church lacks as a whole is uh, is discipleship, discipling, discipling other believers. And that's just like when that knife comes out of that oil, it's it's then a knife, but it still has to be ground. It still has to be sh- it still has to be sharpened before it's effective. So, yeah. and then even after it's sharpened and it'll shave, it still has to be resharpened. So that's right. staying Good in our Bible. Iron sharpens iron. Fellowshipping with other believers. You know, it's it's never it's a tool, just like we're a tool that can be used by the Lord if we stay sharp. So yeah. there's a lot of uh, analogies in the in the knife making process that can apply to the Christian life and and you know how God uses us. It's amazing. We talked about what made you nervous as a dad, what makes you proud as a dad. Man, you look at your kids. Uh, you know, it makes me proud when. Somebody asked my kids, you know, because we homeschool our kids. Now, I use the term we very loosely. Beth homeschooled our kids. <laughs> so, but, um, you know, we so they go with, every, anytime I roll out, they go, we do ministry together, we do life together, and uh, they see that. So what makes me proud is if somebody asks, you know, Gracie, what we do, or she says, we're missionaries. Mm. And uh, we tell people about Jesus and she's six and she hasn't made the decision to follow Christ yet. But she, even though like she's so young, she still understands it because she's modeling what she sees. Yeah. Little glimpses like that makes me think that I might be doing a couple things right. And I've got more to work on than I'm getting right. I know. But, you know, I think we're all kind of we can all nitpick ourselves and, I, and I'll get in a cycle of negative self-talk that can really be pretty brutal but we have to give ourselves credit and when i have those moments you know like calvin he's two and uh he'll come up in the living room and he'll say bye mom he'll say where are you going shop what are you gonna do knives you know it's like (laughs) 
And uh, I think, you know, our, our house is a few hundred yards from where my tractor is. But anytime I start it up, I think Calvin's ears perked up and he's like, tractor, tractor. tractor. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> they, uh, they'll get outside and work and, and um, you know, they don't mind going and serving and loving on people. And that's that's the kind of that's the kind of children that I want to raise is people yeah. is children that love the Lord and love people and want to serve people. And, and that's where Beth and I are headed. And, uh, man, I, I just got to say all credit to her because man, I couldn't, I wouldn't want to ever do this without her, man. She's a rock star. She, she holds, she's the glue, you know? So, um, yeah. man, we need to take care of our wives. We need to love our wives. And I will give you one. If I had to say one thing that's changed our marriage for the better every night, Beth and I pray, I pray with Beth, not just for Beth, but I take her hand and I pray out loud. It's not always easy because mm. we might've just had a big fussing match right before we came in. You know what I mean? Like, right, yeah. She knows, she knows I fart in my sleep. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's rough. You know, it's, it's rough <laughs> yeah. sometimes to, to grab your wife by the hand and pray, pray out loud for her because she knows all your secrets. Uh, but that's what yeah. makes it special because it'll make her feel protected. It'll make her feel loved. It'll make her feel, um, you know, you're asking God to shower blessings on her, no matter how bad y'all just acted towards each other. It is very yeah. awkward and it is going to be hard, but it is very, very worth it for yeah. each other. It's important. Amazing. So, Corey, before we go, you've been very gracious with your time. I know we've talked, touched on this several times in our conversation, but there maybe there's a guy listening, a dad who secretly is battling with an addiction to something, whatever that is. And when they hear your words, they think, man, I wish I could be like Corey. I wish I could be in a new spot where this addiction isn't holding me down or giving me guilt. I'm afraid to tell people about what I'm struggling with. I'm afraid to do community with people because someone's going to know my secret. Which, if I'm not here, it's your podcast, Corey. And you're talking about addiction and you're talking to that person, right, in that situation. From your experience, your knowledge, your wisdom, what do you say to that person who's battling addiction right now? What 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 do you want them to know? So guilt, shame, condemnation, negativity, that comes from the devil. None of that stuff comes from God. None of it. There's not anything negative God's going to put on your life. It's going to take one decision at a time. Take it one decision at a time. You're not going to be able to do it day by day. You're going to have to do it moment by moment. You might fail. If you do, it's okay. Pick yourself up. Try again. You have to keep doing it over and over and over. Consistency is what makes changes. So you make that choice, okay, I'm done. Then the next choice is, I'm still done. The next choice is, I'm still done. The next choice mm. is, I'm still done. And we've got, what, four seconds out yeah. of the day already? So yeah. it's not going to be a, I'm done and I'll walk away. And if it's a lifestyle, if you're surrounded by it, yeah. You got to get away. And if you don't know how, there's a way. You have to find, you can find a group. Maybe start with NA, maybe start with AA, maybe start somewhere. But you have to have people. You have to have people in your life to help you get over this. You have yeah. to have other people in your life holding you accountable. Somebody that will reach down when you screw up, pick you up, dust you off, give you a hug, say, bro, it's going to be okay, man. I got you. Like you got to find somebody. Maybe that's a pastor. Maybe that's uh, a person, a sponsor at a group. But you can't do it by yourself. You can't. You have yeah. to have other people in your lives, in your life, that are that are willing to help you and that are willing to pick you up and dust you off and help you get back going again. Can't do it. It's good. I love it. And back to what you said earlier, your quote that you heard someone else say, but... None of us is smarter than all of us. I love that. It's amazing. Um, Corey, thank you so much for what you do. Um, I know you're not doing it for your own accolades, but someone someone wasn't doing it, and you saw a need, you stepped in, 
and I just see the ripple effect of what you do in the world, not just in the U.S. and your community, but around the world. And people are hearing this around the world. So that's inspiring to me in a podcast setting to have you come on and share your story. And I just want you to understand that there's a lot of people hearing you today, maybe for the first time, have never heard of Yates Unicorn Rants, but now they do. And they might be listening to this, Corey, going, I love what Corey's doing. I would love to be there with him, but I can't, but I would love to support him. I know on your website there is a support tab. There is. Can you tell us what can we do as a listener to help you with these amazing goals that you have for Yates Unicorn Ranch? What can we do to support you? So that's great, man. Number one, pray. Uh, that's the that's the thing that we can do that anybody can do anywhere is pray. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're able to give, that's great. Um, we are a nonprofit, uh, so we we um, you know some people care about tax deductions, some people don't. Uh, that's an option, uh, just in case anybody's interested in that. Uh, but we, um, you can give. There's an e-giving platform where you can set up a monthly donation if you want to give every month. Um, there's links on there to um, our Instagram and all of our Facebook and TikTok and all that stuff is all Yates Unicorn Ranch. Uh, we have, um, I post a video every day. It's called Hot Mess Discipleship. We're out, right now I'm going through the book of James. We just finished up chapter two. We're about to go in, into chapter three. And uh, then I post a prayer on Wednesdays. It's about, um, you know, whatever I'm going through or whatever the Holy Spirit lays on my heart, I post that on Wednesdays. And uh, I just try to let people know that, man, being a Christian is tough, man. It's it's a struggle. And, and living for God is tough. Staying sober is tough. Being a parent is tough, man. All these things that we have to accomplish in our life, it's not easy. So I'm just trying to provide a place for people to come and, and understand that, man, we're going to fall, but God loves us and, and he has grace for us. And even if you're not into religion, that's good because I'm not in religion either. If you're not mm. a Christ follower, then we're still a place for you, man, because we don't require any of that stuff for y'all to be involved in what we're doing. And that's just, that's, these are my beliefs and these are like, but you best believe if you're in my presence, you're going to get some Jesus. So, <laughs> Yeah. But uh, yes. Be warned right now. Be warned. That's yeah, right. I love that's it. right. Yeah. That's right. And it might, it might just be through yeah. my actions. I might not say anything about him, but I'm going to do my best to try to represent him in a way that is that is glorifying. And I, I will fail, but I'm going to do my best. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Corey, thank you so much for doing this, being on Dad Space. And for from one dad to another dad, keep going. Um, keep loving those kids. Keep showing up for them. You get like 18, 19 years with these kids and then they're off to do their own thing, yeah. right? And, uh, you know, it's it's not a big number. So enjoy every moment with these amazing kids you have. It's great. You know, that was never more apparent than um, last month when I married my oldest daughter. She's 23. I got a son that's 26 and a daughter that's 23. And then my youngest daughters were their ring bearer or their flower girls and my sons were their ring bearers. So I was standing on, on the podium wow. marrying them and just watching the... And it just went that, man. I mean, I know. Boom. And uh, that was never more real to me than in that moment. Uh, you know, when it because just, it was just like that. So yeah. cherish, cherish the, even the hard times, cherish the hard times, man. But Dave, I, I want to yeah. tell you I, that I'm grateful for this opportunity, man. Thank you so much for having me on here. I, I'm grateful for what you do. It's important work, man. You, you sharing the yeah. resources and, uh, man, there's there's more guys that need to be doing what you're doing, man. I'm just grateful for for your heart and uh, for your mission. And if there's any way that I can help you, I'm here for you, buddy. It's amazing. So we'll have a link to Corey's website. We'll have a link to Dad's Edge Alliance as well. You need to go check out their podcast, check out their community. It's amazing. Um, Corey, thank you so much for being part of the podcast. Glad to have you here. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate it, man. Hey, thanks for listening to Dad Space today. I'm so thankful that you were here for this episode. If uh, you like the show, please let another dad know. Hey, <laughs> that kind of rhymed. Anyways, uh, share the episode out with somebody in your circle who would love Dad Space. That means so much to us here for our guests who donate their time to be on the show. And we just want to see this grow. So... Again, another rhyme. Oh, wow. Anyhow, I <laughs> um, think I need to write a song or something. Thank you for being here for with Dad Space. And again, looking forward to the next episode. 
look forward to having you here again with us. And if we can help you in any way, if you have a great guest idea for the show, a topic that we would, you would love us to cover, we would love to do that here on Dad Space. So thanks for listening and thanks for being part of the community. And to you, Dad, thank you for listening and thank you for sharing Dad Space. Catch you on the next one. Take care.